A long time ago, before Christmas began, God's people were waiting for God's special plan. And they'd wondered for years how this plan would unfurl, till an angel appeared to a young teenage girl. Though Mary was troubled, the angel proclaimed, You've found favour with God, do not be afraid. You will conceive and give birth to a son. Call his name Jesus, the King has now come. I am the Lord's servant, she said in belief. But when Joseph found out, he was filled up with grief. For Mary and Joseph had not yet got married. What would people think of this baby she carried? An angel of God came to him in a dream and helped Joseph see it was not as it seemed. It was God's Holy Spirit that brought life within. This baby had come to save people from sin. So Joseph and Mary and baby-to-be set off to Bethlehem, as was decreed. But when they arrived, there was nowhere to stay, no more rooms to be found for this babe on the way. And then soon the time came, she gave birth to a son. The long-promised king had now finally come. And they weren't in a palace, all cosy and warm. Where the animals feed was where this king was born. And while crowds in the town were all still fast asleep, there were shepherds nearby, watching over their sheep. Until something disrupted the darkness of night. An angel appeared, and the sky filled with light. The glory of God all around them displayed, the angel declaring, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause you great joy. The Saviour is born as a baby, a boy. The shepherds saw angels sing glory and peace, and they said to each other, Now let's go and see. They hurried to find this great king of the Jews. Then in awe and amazement, they spread the good news. Now far in the east, men most clever and wise had seen a strange star that was starting to rise. They knew that a king was the cause of this star, so they set off to find him and followed it far. Till it stopped at the place where the boy would be found, and in wonder and worship, they humbly bowed down. They opened their treasures, and what did they bring? But frankincense, gold, and myrrh for a king. A king who was little, a king who could cry, who was fragile and feeble, and one day would die. The powerful king, who'd been promised for years, who would share in our suffering and take up our tears. For though he was rich, God chose to be poor. He made himself nothing, so we could be sure. That God is now with us, the King has come near. Good news for all people, Jesus is here. Good morning, welcome on this Christmas morning to St Mary's Sarby. We wish you a very happy Christmas and hope that God will bless your time together today as a family. Yea, Lord, we greet thee born this happy morning. And this morning, on Christmas morning, we're going to look at one of the most glorious passages in Scripture, John 1, verses 1 to 18. But instead of doing what we normally do, which is have the words scroll across the screen, we're going to read it together. So please, if you've got a Bible in the house, go and get it, and then we'll read the Scriptures together. So here we go. John 1, starting to read at verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him were all things made. Without him was nothing made that was made. 
In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only to witness to the light, the true light that gives light to every man who was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognise him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. We'll stop there at verse 14. Let's pray together and then we'll think about that passage. Heavenly Father, we this Christmas morning want to thank you that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And as we think about this passage, we ask you, Lord, to open it to us and open our hearts to receive it. In Jesus' name, Amen. Again, Happy Christmas. So this Christmas, if you could meet somebody famous, I don't know who your uh, dream person is you'd like to meet, I suspect they'd be probably rich, they'd probably be influential, or they would probably have made a mark in the world. And most people who make a mark in the world are noticeable, powerful, great, wise. But the one thing that babies aren't is great, wise and powerful. And so we could dismiss this baby that we've come to worship this morning as no more than an insignificant little baby. But actually, he is the most impressive baby ever born. The Gospels, all of them, show us different facets of Christ. Mark, we see, contains the story of a servant. Luke, we see a human being made in man's image. And in Matthew we see a king. But in John, we're taken to a different plane. We're seeing a little baby who is in fact the divine God, the God King. And the passage can be divided quite simply into three simple words. Great, saviour and grace giving. The last one's not three words, so excuse me for that. So let's first of all Think about great. One commentator reminded us that there are about 100 billion stars in the average galaxy. And there are at least 100 million galaxies in known space. Albert Einstein believed that we've scanned with our largest telescopes only one billionth of the theoretical space. Which means there are probably something like 10 octillion stars and planets in the universe. How many is that? Well, a one with three noughts is a thousand. Add another three thoughts, you get a noughts, you get a million. Add another three, you get a billion. And add another three, you get a trillion. Add another three, you get a quadrillion. And it goes on. But what we actually have is one with 27 zeros after it. And this baby, it tells us, made everything. Through him, it says in verse 3, all things were made. Without him was nothing was made that was made. He is the creator God. He is the almighty God. And that is this baby that we've come to worship. He is the creator of everything from the stars and the galaxies to the tiniest microism organism on the face of the planet. To the cellular level, he created everything. He is the God of heaven. And yet that God of heaven that creator God became known to us as a babe because he loves us. We can trust him. If he made everything, then we can trust him with our lives because he knows how things work. There was an engineer who worked for Henry Ford. He could build a motor car in his mind. He could 
break it down and fix it in his mind. He could build a production line in his mind. One day, the assembly line at uh, Ford's factory broke down. None of Ford's men could fix it, so he rang this engineer who came over and tinkered for a few minutes, threw a switch, and the production line started to run smoothly again. A few days later, Henry Ford received a bill from this engineer for $10,000. Now, in the 1920s, $10,000 was a lot of money. So Ford wrote back to him and said, Charlie, don't you think your bill's a little high for just a little bit of tinkering? The engineer wrote back and said, tinkering, $10, knowing where to tinker, $9,990. Only Jesus knows where to tinker in our lives because he made us. He made the universe. He knows how to keep it in perfect running order. He knows which screw to turn, which belt to loosen, and which is the most beneficial octane of fuel to run the universe on. And when we fight him and we push back on how things should be ordered, we shouldn't be surprised when things go wrong. He knows how best our marriages should operate. He knows how best families should be ordered. A man and a woman in a lifelong heterosexual union. He knows how we best to be a father. He knows how best to be a parent. He knows how best to handle the money that we have. And he knows best how society should be ordered. He is a great God, this baby an almighty God, an immense God, who came to be with us and yet was the same God that everything was created through. He knows exactly how the world should operate. Secondly, this baby came to save. He came to be our saviour. The ultimate act of love in a family is to turn on the light and help somebody see what they're doing in the dark. I want you to imagine humanity, you've been going to look at the world, imagine it as a room with no lights on, and humanity's crashing around in the room causing war and damage and greed and failure. That's humanity crashing around in the dark. And God came to bring light. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness is not understood. We don't understand God, but we do receive his presence. He came to bring light. He came to witness, to witness to our state of mind and how we need to see what's really going on in our lives. When the light's on, you can see where you should go and how you should live. Who's more foolish, the child who's afraid of the dark or the man who's afraid of the light? We like the dark. That's the problem. We like the dark because in the dark we think we can hide what we're doing from God, but we can't because the light shines into the deepest recesses of our lives. We only have to look at the world to see what man is like when he's allowed to live in the, what he perceives the dark. Greedy, selfish, warlike, narcissistic. And the good bits, well, they're generally few and far between. And generally, they're hidden and not seen very often. We're more likely to be uh, narcissistic and selfish and not very nice people. But when we put on the light, we can see how God means us to live. We can see how life is meant to be lived and how we can avoid disaster. Eric Liddell, the famous uh, runner, you don't know if you remember Chariots of Fire, he refused to run on a Sunday in the Paris Olympics because it was God's day. And he wrote these words. I believe that God made me for a purpose. He also made me fast. When I run, I feel his pleasure. When we operate in the light, we feel the pleasure of God. And that baby came so that you didn't need to crash around in the dark. He came to bring light and hope and peace and purpose into your life change bitterness for love and to bring forgiveness. I prefer the ESV's translation of verse 5. Verse 5 reads, the light shines in the darkness because the darkness has not understood it. A better Greek translation is the darkness has not overtaken or not a darkness has not overtaken or squashed the light. The darkness seems all-consuming but that tiny baby came and a light that has 
shone in this world for 2,000 years has never gone out. There's no dimmer switch, by the way, on God's light. We have just decided we prefer the darkness. To be a child of God is to be loved and wanted beyond our wildest dreams and to know pure love in a way that nobody else on earth knows it. Finally, I want to pick up with the theme of grace because at the end of our passage, it says that he came full of grace and truth. God looks at you this Christmas morning and sees you as your sinful, rebellious, prodigal child that you are, spitting in his face, wallowing in sin, grieving his spirit. But because this child came on that first Christmas morning, the Christ filled with grace, he can call us to repentance with open loving arms saying, come home child, despite us being sinful, rebellious, prodigal children, spitting in God's face and wallowing in our sin. He's not ignorant of what you've done and what I've done. He knows everything we've done. His knowledge of who we are will never hinder his love for us though. He's even aware of the evil behind our righteous deeds. The intimacy by which God knows us is remarkable, but the intimacy of his love embracing his children is supernatural. Grace is mind-blowing. I might wear a dog collar, but I'm still a sinner. And when I consider what God has done for me in Jesus Christ, I am brought to tears. But I think grace is so easily misunderstood. The often repeated definition of grace is that it's an undeserved gift. But that doesn't go far enough. Grace is a gift, but God isn't just the giver of the gift. He is himself the gift. God graces us with himself in Jesus Christ because he dwells with us. But what do we often think grace is? Well, we need to correct that view. Grace is not permission to sin. If God graciously forgives sin, then why struggle for a sin-free life? I'm good at sinning, God's good at forgiving. That's a match made in heaven, right? No! Grace is not permission to sin. Neither does grace fill the gaps. You do your best and God will do the rest. According to this understanding, we do most of the heavy lifting on our own. And then God spots us on the last few steps when we're tired. How nice to see God finish off what we start. No, 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 no. God's grace isn't that. Is God's grace God letting upon his standards? Most people think that in the Old Testament God was obsessed with holiness and upheld an almost unrealistic standard for his people. Keep the rules was the banner of heaven. But then the New Testament came along and God must, it seems, have woken up to the right side of the cloud and finally decided to lower his standards to just love his people for who they are. No, he loves us despite who we are. Finally, we mistakenly think of grace as being only for godly people. As much as people must, might, may not say this explicitly, many believe it deep down. It results from the simple misconception that God loves people rather than God loves make people good. But the Bible is not a story of God looking for good people. That's the great message of the Christian hope of Christmas. God isn't waiting for you to be perfect to welcome you into the kingdom. God welcomes you as you are. Grace is for ungodly people, but it is transformatory for ungodly people. It changes them from who they were to who they should be. God's grace is God's love meeting us where we are, but refusing to let us stay where we are. This is because when grace of God takes root in your heart, it produces fruit in your life. Grace is not a matter of God lowering his standards, but transforming people. The baby came to enable you to be transformed into the person God intends you to be. Now, I don't know about you, but there are always those people who you get Christmas cards from who you haven't seen for a long time. They're distant, and maybe they're distant relatives. Some of us are like that with God. We are distant relatives who see him once a year when we send a card. But he doesn't want us to be like that. The baby came to transform us into children fully loved and fully known. We are witnessing to a world, we are bringing a message to a world that is unable to find any answers. 
in transforming itself. If you look around, you see war, inflation, out of control, despair, famine, and death itself. And the world's statisticians and politicians are unable to know the best way to calculate the spread. The world's industries are unable to keep up with the needed supplies. The world's markets are panicking and they're on their downward spiral. The, all our experts seem to be children incapable of dealing with the problems. Closer to home, we see food banks more needed than ever and our freedoms as Christians lost as things change. Everybody seems to feel that things have been shaken to the core. We feel anxiety about toilet paper and bread. This would be laughable, wouldn't it, five years ago? Yet these basic situations have been good because over the last two years we've been stripped of our illusion of dependence on self. We're all children looking for a heavenly father, looking for somebody to give us peace, purpose, and we need to look to the great saviour God filled with grace and truth. The real question this Christmas morning is whose child are you? Are you no one's child? Are you an orphan? Or are you someone's child, a son or daughter of God? Desperation forces us to notice the difference and to seek the light and to trust again in the great creator God who made the world to function in a certain way. One commentator summed it all up like this. John concludes his prologue with the sentence, no one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Jesus is the explanation of God. If you're seeking to find out what God is like, look at that baby. The greatness of Christ explains the greatness of God. The greatness of Christ's love explains the greatness of the Father's love. The greatness of Christ's grace explains the greatness of the Father's grace. We may, may we continue to have our concept of God made bigger as we had gone a journey with him, looking for him and asking him to guide us in how we live and function in the world. I love Narnia. Narnia is one of my favourite stories. It's one of my favourite films. And we all know that uh, Aslan is meant to be Jesus Christ. And as Aslan speaks to Lucy, he says, every year you grow, you will find me bigger. What he's saying, every year you will get a better understanding of me, you'll find me bigger and more able, more, more of a, amazing. We need to do that with God. Don't pack him away this Christmas with all the decorations. Spend 2023 investigating the God of John 1, who came for you who came to bring light and truth and grace into your life. And if you're interested in doing that, join us on the 26th of January in the church centre at seven o'clock for Hope Explored, when we will investigate these things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that at Christmas we can celebrate that you are the giver of grace, light and truth that you are the creator God who knows how the world should function and all you do is ask us to follow in your footsteps. Bless us this Christmas. Bless us this Christmas morning. Help us to have good times with our families. We pray for those, Lord, who do not have family with them today, who are lonely or who are mourning and there's an empty seat at the table. We pray that you would pour out your grace and truth and mercy and peace upon them. But most of all, we pray that we would get a greater impression and understanding of who you really are and why you came. Amen. Have an amazing Christmas. I hope God blesses it to you. And I look forward to seeing you in 2023.
there are few emotions more powerful than hope. It's a spark inside you that brings a smile to your lips, a light that shows on your face, a feeling that lifts your head and pulls you forward. These days, hope like that often feels hard to come by. Maybe you've experienced your share of disappointments, but real hope is what the Christian faith claims to offer. A joyful expectation for the future, based on true events in the past, which changes everything about my present. Hope Explored is a three session series for anyone who is looking for a hope worth having. Whatever you do or don't believe, this is your invitation to explore, to discuss, to question, to discover. This is Hope Explored. Thank you.